Have you ever had a chance to talk to a ghostwriter? No, not that kind of ghostwriter. The sort that helps other people get their stories out. In today's episode, I chat with Kent Sanders, a professional ghostwriter. And wait till you hear about the latest book he helped write. You're going to know who it is about. I promise. Okay, here's a hint. Graceland. Kent is also the host of the Daily Writer podcast and the founder of the Daily Writer Club, a membership community that helps writers build a business with their skills. I can't wait to get started, so we're getting started. Welcome to Jackie Just Chatters. By sharing people's stories, I strive to generate laughter, inspiration, maybe help you escape from the stressful world. I am your hostess, Jackie Lentz, who's still figuring out her own story. This podcast comes out every other Thursday. I can be found wherever you get your podcast or on YouTube. I'd be most grateful if you left me some stars or a review and subscribe if you never want to miss an episode. Thank you for listening and sharing. Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining me. I hope you're doing okay. Are you doing okay? You taking care of yourself? Drinking enough water? Setting boundaries? Going to bed on time? Limiting that screen time as well? Yeah, me neither. But hey, we can try better this week. I did something exciting. I got an account on Instagram. I felt that eye roll. I know, getting on Instagram excited people like a decade ago. But I take my time before adopting a new technology. If you're wondering if I am on TikTok, I think you can guess that answer. But hey, you can help this dinosaur get dragged into the modern world. Go and follow me over on Instagram. I would love to hit 100 followers by the end of March. If you want to help me out, my handle is at Jackie Lentz. That's J-A-C-Q-U-I. L-E-N-T-S. Okay, enough shameless begging. My guest today, Kent Sanders, is a real talker. And so am I. Let's just say I left quite a bit of our chat on the cutting room floor. But even with those edits, it still was a lengthy piece. Result, I'm cutting it into two parts. Yes, again. Without further ado... On to my conversation with Mr. Sanders. My guest today is fellow Gen Xer Kent Sanders, a man who I can only assume does not sleep. He is an author, a ghostwriter, a teacher at St. Louis Christian College, a podcaster, a husband, and father. He plays guitar and recently ran a writer's workshop. Okay, I need a nap after listing all this. <laughs> like, Welcome to the show, and how the heck do you do all this? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. So I actually am no longer a professor at St. Louis Christian College. Uh, I haven't been there for a couple of years. So I, I must have either not updated my bio on a website somewhere, which doesn't <laughs> surprise me, um, or I sent you probably some some something that was a little outdated. But anyway, I, that is one job I it's don't It's on your website. Phone. You might want to change that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anybody who's listening who's like, looking, looking to your guests today for personal branding. Don't take my, don't follow my horrible example of not updating my bio on my website. I'm actually getting ready to redo all that stuff, but, um, but yeah, all the rest of it's pretty, pretty accurate. Um, I write, I ghostwrite, I do play a little bit of music. I do podcasting and I run a membership group. So it sounds like I'm busier than I really am, but, um, but I I do like to stay busy though. I have to be honest with you. I like having multiple things going on. How do you make time for you? That's a, that's a really good question. I would say uh, that, that, that's a really good question. How would I answer that? I write typically in the mornings. I try to in the early mornings. Uh, I don't do that every single day in the early morning, but I always try to do that. Um, but then in the evenings, um, you know, I typically go for a run. I have at least an hour in the evenings where I'm just kind of doing some fun stuff. I like putting together models or watching a TV show with my wife or whatever it is. So I have plenty of time for myself, but I also operate on the idea that 
you sh- all things being equal, you should try to do work in your life or have a career that energizes you. Therefore, you don't need to always escape from it by doing lots and lots of crazy hobbies or, you know, watching five hours of TV a day or, or whatever it is. So I don't really need to run away from that in, in the same way that many people feel like they have to run away from their day jobs. That went a whole different direction than I was really thinking, but I guess that's kind of <laughs> how I feel. <laughs> you live to work. There are two types of people. Those who work to live that they don't necessarily like, I find like they don't hate their job, Mm -hmm. but it's just, it's something they do. And then the rest of the time they get to do the things they really love. Like not everyone's going to be a professional artist, but they, that's their joy. So they work a job that allows them to then spend time doing yeah. their joy yeah. where other people they there's just something about i i'm one of these people um and it, it and it can get us into trouble and burnout that we want a job that is meaningful fulfilling and it's more than just a source of income yeah yeah I, ideally i think that's a great goal to have i th- i pretty much think you know, you should do what you want to in life. Life's pretty short. You need to make it count while you're in the game. So live the kind of life that you want to live. I've had a lot of conversations with people the last couple of years. So I've been in my business full-time really only two years. And, you know, I could be your guest today, Jackie, and say, oh, it's been a great journey. And and I've learned so much and I've grown so much and had all these successes. And I have had some successes, uh, which, which have been very satisfying. I've also have a, I've had a lot of failures over over the years. And it's not all been smooth sailing. I've had a lot of things to learn. I've had a lot of mindset issues to overcome. And running your own business is really, really different than working for somebody else, oh, at least yeah. in, in my experience. And I didn't really know what I was getting into, even though I, I wouldn't change it. Um, I, I, I feel like as a person of integrity, I have to be honest and say, it's been really challenging at times. Because when you are your own boss, there's nobody else to blame for your problems or for your shortcomings. When something doesn't go as planned, it's you can't turn to somebody else and go, man, you really messed that up. It's it's you. You know, you're the one calling the shots and running the show. So And you're responsible for finding the solutions. Yeah. Like that's well, which a, is it also is- the biggest it's a the biggest blessing, but also the biggest curse. Because the solution is right there at hand. You are you have to be the solution to your own problems if you own your own business. Or you have to get solutions from somebody else who you hire or consult with or whatever. But at the same time, it's really hard to change ingrained patterns of thinking and, and habits that you've built over your whole life. If you're a person like me who has had jobs his whole life, then owning your own business is a really different deal. And you have to kind of be willing to accept what that means and be willing to accept the responsibility for it, which is not easy. No. But, you know, there's really only two choices that you have. If you're not independently wealthy, you either have to work for somebody else or you can work for yourself. Totally shifting gears. You and I are born in the same year. So I feel this connection because we're going to understand so many of the same pop culture references. You know, it's just anyone who was born the same time. You're like, there's this affinity like, yeah, oh, you understand me. Okay. Thank goodness. Now. Like you, I'm probably know what it was like to send out for one of those prizes or product things from the cereal box Mm -hmm. and that endless wait for that thing to come back to you. You know, it was like six to eight weeks at least before it got back to you. Did you partake in those? I don't know if I sent stuff out of the cereal, but I did read a lot of comic books as a kid. And I remember occasionally sending, st- I would clip things out of there. Yep. I would send it off in the mail and you would have to wait for weeks to, to get those back. Same thing with, uh, I don't know if you ever ordered books. Remember the scholastic book? Order <gasps> sheet you got in school? Love scholastic. Oh, it was so torturous. If you were a reader, you know, it was torturous because first of all, you gotta have, you gotta have a way to get some money. Yeah. Your parents. Or you have to earn it somehow. 
And then, you know, you bring your envelope of, of dollar bills and random change, change to your teacher. Yep. You have to clip out that little thing on the side and you have to mark which books you want for me. There was always a Garfield book included in there somewhere or a peanuts book. And then you would wait like two months. And then one magical day, somebody would bring in the scholastic box to your classroom and you would be like, Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. It was and like the Christmas. You got the books. It was magical. It was. I, I love scholastic time. That was, oh, that was fabulous. A blast. I guess they still do that. I think in schools. They should. It's, and it gets you so excited about reading. You think of books yeah. as a gift. Totally. It's like this, pri- especially because it's been so long, even though you paid for it, it kind of feels like you won the lotto. Yeah. Yeah. That you're like, oh my gosh, it's book day. It's book day. <laughs> yeah. I, I just really loved that. It was so exciting. <laughs> One of the hats I previously listed that you wear is that of author, and you've written your own book called 18 Words to Live By. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to write this book? So this was the summer of, let's see, this is 2023 when we're recording this. This was 2021, and my son was 17 at the time, and his birthday is in April, So in the summer of that year, the few months after he turned 17, it just kind of dawned on me one day that, oh, he's going to be 18 next year. Now, of course, I knew that already, but there's something about the realization that your kid is going to be 18, you know, officially an adult, where you go, oh, they're like going to be 18 next year, meaning they're going to be an adult and they're probably going to be moving out and they're going to graduate and all that. So I just wondered, what could I get my son for his birthday that? would be really meaningful. And so I just started thinking and and it dawned on me one day, well, I'm a writer. That's the main thing that I do. So why don't I write him a book? At the same time, knowing an 18 year old is not going to be that excited about a book. And it's not going to be <laughs> something he's going to appreciate until he's probably 40, you know? So I decided to write a little book on basically the most important values that I wanted him to carry with him throughout his life. And I, I just sat down and I just started listing ideas and, and thinking of what are the things that I would really want to impart to my kid? And what are the, the main values that I have tried to teach to him? What are the main values that I have tried to live by? And I made a list of probably 30 or 40 different things. And then I just kind of whittled them down to 18 because I thought, well, 18 is a great number. He's going to be 18. And so I just kind of connected the dots there and then that's really how the book came about. And now I'm working on the follow-up to that, which is called 19 Reasons to Keep Going. The idea being every year for his birthday until he's 30, that he gets a little book from dad as his main gift for his birthday. Oh, wow. So that when I'm dead and gone decades from now, hopefully, that he'll have something that he can hopefully treasure and that he can pass down to his kids and grandkids. My mom, she recently did one of those um, personal books. They they send you questions, uh, yeah. emails, and then you take your time and you write your response and you share your stories and you can add photos and then they'll put it all together and make a book out of it. And so all of me and my siblings, we all have a copy of my That's mom's. Cool. It is. I think they're fabulous because it, it's, you're right. You want those stories you want those memories and and what's nice is they send them to you like one question at a time so you're mm-hmm. not overwhelmed and you you can work on whatever question you want how much time you want to spend on it i think those are are, are wonderful and that the next generation will enjoy them and so forth nice that's fantastic in your introduction you talked about what a father can pass down to their child. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the obvious tangible things, money items. You also hit upon how personality traits can be passed down. My grandparents lived through the great depression and their caution with money. I can see that how it impacted my parents, even though 
they didn't grow up in the Great Depression, that impact of of their parents living through it came through them. And I can see how they raised us a certain way to Mm -hmm. be cautious with money, to have certain financial values. And I was wondering what kind of personality traits you've noticed that have been handed down to you. And do you accept them or have you tried to reject them? Some of the traits are good and some of them are not so good. That's a really good question. I think that's the case with any parent is that a, a discerning person can see qualities or traits within their parents that they like and ones that they don't like. And hopefully we're all mature and aware enough to recognize what those things are and to try and make a conscious decision to be different if there are things that that we want to change. One of the things that I learned from my dad was he's a very generous person. He's very affable. People love him. He's a talker. Even though he's, I would describe my dad as an extrovert, I'm really an introvert, but I still have that tendency of whenever I see somebody out and about, I still will stand and talk to them for a while because that's just, I don't know why I'm just kind of wired that way. And I, I, I think I've, I've received his tendency to want to help people and to try and be generous and to, to be thoughtful of others and, and those kinds of things. For my mom, I really got a sense of being an analytical person. She's where I got my writing impulse. She's a really great communicator and writer herself. So she was really the source more of that. On page 11 of your book, you wrote that it is useful to live by a set of values. When did you realize that you had a set of values? I think there have been different manifestations of that probably over the years. So I came from a an academic and a church ministry background. And in both of those settings, it's pretty common to, to go through exercises occasionally where you're thinking about what is your mission? What's your personal vision? What are the things that are important to you? And those kinds of things. And I'm sure I had been through different exercises over the years where I had been through some of those, those things. And I'm a very introspective person. I've always been a journaler. So I've always intuitively kind of thought about the things that are important to me. And I've tried to dig into those things. And why is this important? And why do, why do I keep making these mistakes? And why can't I get this thing right? And And why did this thing succeed or this thing fail? I've always asked those questions of myself all the time, but it really wasn't until I did this book that I consciously sat down and and thought through what, what to me are the most important values that I have tried to live by. And I think that you can look at that from two sides. One is that you have to sit down and identify what are the things that I am already practicing? In other words, what am I already trying to live out? But at the same time, I think that also empowers you to do better in those areas where you sit down and you think, well, I consciously want to aspire to these other things, or maybe I can improve in these different areas. So the act of sitting down and thinking through your personal values, I think it has a way of helping you to, to understand yourself better and why, why you are the way you are and where you are in life. But it also has the sense of it, it kind of propels you forward to think, okay, Now that I have identified this group of values, I I want to aspire to these more in my life. Like, for example, the very first thing in the book is chapter one is on responsibility. And that's something I really believe very strongly is that you have to take responsibility in your life. You can't blame other people for where you are or the things that are frustrating to, I mean, there is a sense in which you can blame others because other people do impact us, but ultimately you have to take responsibility. I really responded to that chapter on responsibility. Mm. And it got me thinking about the limits of responsibility. Because I agree with you. I think we need to be proactive about owning our own crap. Yeah. The good, the bad, you know, like this is mine. But 
there's also the problem of like, like a lot of teachers, I have problems with being a control freak. (laughs) I want to control everything. And there's a problem. Your responsibility has to stop at a point. You have to recognize, okay, all this stuff out here, that's not my responsibility. It's not mine to control. I can't control how somebody reacts, how somebody feels. That's not my purview. Well, I've heard it said, and I, yeah, I think this is a really good, good conversation. I've heard it said before that if there is a problem that you can't do anything about, it's not really a problem. It's a fact. And I've thought about that statement many, many times over the years. And I think that's really true because you can have something. Okay. For example, um, the office where I am, the person who's next door to me, I'm trying to choose my words carefully here. The person who's next door to me, uh, maybe I, I shall not reveal where I am, is a counselor. There are two or three days a week where for a couple hours, she has clients in there. A couple of them are really loud. This happened to me on Friday where it was really hard to concentrate. Uh, apparently, I can't get away from loud noises where um, they were really loud because the walls are not really thick. You know, they're just drywall. And I was like, okay, I have a few hours a week. It's going to be kind of a distraction. So what can I change? Can I change my location in this building? Not really because I'm already here. They've already assigned to me this specific office. Can I change her hours or her clients? No. But what can I do? Well, I can either go home for those couple hours and work, or I can put in headphones and I can work. Those are really my two options if I want to continue working. And so I just chose to put in my air AirPods and have some white noise going during that time. And that was my solution to it. And I think that's how you have to look at life. Can you change this other thing? Can you do something about it? No. Well, if you can't change that other factor that's causing you problems, then you're the one that has to adjust or change. Either that or you just have to put up with it, whatever it is. Winnie the Pooh. Mr. Sanders is the name on the sign over Pooh Bear's doorway. Don't believe me? Go look it up. I just thought of this now. I I could have asked Kent about that, which I think it's super cool to have a name connected to Winnie the Pooh. I'd be interested to know, does Kent think it's as cool as I am? Or is he like, whatever, I'm done with that. Anyway, okay, that was a mental wandering I had there for a moment. I had to share. Check out the second half of this interview where Kent and I will cover how to be better listeners, what does a ghostwriter do, and that Graceland connection I hinted about earlier. All that and more is found in the second half. I hope you check it out. I'm going to put all of Kent's social media links in my episode notes, and I'm going to see you on the flip side.